I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat, we drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Wow. Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco, and every time I come back here, I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum. Welcome to today's program, True Life Lessons with Lonnie Love. Lonnie is a comedian, co-host of Fox's daytime talk show The Real, and author of the new book, I Tried to Change So You Don't Have To, True Life Lessons. She's in conversation with Bay Area-based speaker and writer, Laron Barton. If you'd like to ask either of them a question during this program, you can do that in either the chat or comment section of the live stream. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but to keep you informed during this pandemic, we're going full speed ahead with a full slate of live online programs. Most of these conversations are currently free to the public, so we do ask that you consider donating to help us continue our work. Please visit us at commonwealthclub.org online to learn more about our virtual programming, and you can also text the word DONATE to 415-329-4231 during this program. Now, please join me in welcoming Laron Barton and Lonnie Love to Inforum. Thank you, Crystal. Hello and welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Laron Barton and I'm a writer, speaker, and activist. I'm pleased to be in conversation with Lonnie Love. Lonnie has had a long career in Hollywood as a comedian and co-host of Fox's The Real. And today she's joining us to talk about her untraditional path to success. Her new memoir, I Tried So You Don't Have To, chronicles Lonnie's journey in the entertainment industry 
and how learning to love herself was the missing piece in unlocking her true potential. Let's get started. Lonnie, thank you for joining us today. Hello, LeBron, and thank you to the Commonwealth Club for this time. Oh man, like thank you for uh, uh, for uh, for coming by. Like I just want to say, like I'm I'm a fan. Um, I watched the reel a couple of times. Like y'all just be y'all be going in um, on men, but it's <laughs> um, but, but it's all good. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> We, it's just truthful. It's just not really? so much. Okay. And we're not that bad, but it's truthful. <laughs> you, uh, you know, like uh, sometimes when I watch the show, I'm, I'm like, man, like you know, they, they be going in. But then I, uh, but then after I, I, I kind of, I kind of reflect and I say to myself, I'm like, okay, so sometimes men can be a little trifling, like, like that. But, <laughs> but you know, the purpose is to always start a conversation. It's not, you know, and this is the opinion. It's not definitely the truth or something it's just to start a conversation that's all i can dig that so now um let's talk about your book i try so you don't you don't have to first off i, I, I tried like to change so you I'm, don't I'm, have to exactly <laughs> yes ma'am I, I apologize for that it's okay um i like the book because it because it was an easy read i mean i i found myself breezing through it and i i darn near finished it uh in uh in in two days, uh, it was it was it was very funny, but it was also informative, and it really kind of brought us into your life. Um, the book opens with you at the daytime Emmys. How did it feel to be there with your co-host after five years working on the reel? You know, um, I never imagined growing up as a little girl in Detroit that you know the the shows that I watched and people holding the trophy and saying, you know, this is for you, my I never right. would you couldn't have told me that, that would be me. And so in the book, I talk about the feeling of, of winning an Emmy. As a matter of fact, I have it right here. Nice. <laughs> Bring it out. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, and I just, you know, I just want to thank everyone for this moment. And it was like, and you know, when you watch on, on television, you're like, right. why are they crying? And it's right. like, wow, I know right. why they cry now because it took a lot to get that. And it's it's not about it, it's not about you know um, accolades. It's more about the work that it took to get to this point. And then your peers are saying, you know what, we like what you did, and we we just want to acknowledge that. So that's that was more the feeling for me, um, winning the Emmy. That here it was a diverse show that was built to give a diverse conversations, give America another view of life. And, you know, our peers said, you know what? The show's okay. We, we like, we right. like the show. So that, that was a lot. And I talk about that a lot. And I talk about what it took to make a show like the real and why the real is an important show, like all other diverse um, voices right now, especially right now. Right. Uh, one interesting thing about the real is that it's, filled with women who are not white. You know, we have uh, <laughs> black women. We have black, uh, I know, right? Crazy, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> we have black women. We have Latinx women. We have we have Asian women. How important was that uh, for you to be a part of a show like that? Um, initially, I was always trying to get my own show. And I talk about that. But like, I want my own show. Right. Um, but she won everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a reason why you want your own show. Um, right. But when it was presented to me, the, the, the reel was presented to me, it was presented as this is something that is needed and it's something that um, we think that you could really help to be a part of. Um, but I really initially, what and people will find out in the book, I initially was just there just helping them out because sure. I had a production deal with telepictures. So basically I was, you know, trying to get my own show, but then they came up with this idea and developed it. And then they were like, well, we want about four or five women. Why don't you just come in and sit and do a, a chemistry <laughs> test, chemistry? And I was like, you know, it, and so in your mind, you think, well, let me just make them happy. Let me go sit sure. down and sit in there and just help them out. And some of everybody came in the chemistry uh, read and when you do a chemistry read, you're sitting at a table, it's dark, um, and they're just mixing and matching people. What I didn't know was that we would be mix mixing and matching for like 10 hours, and wow. I'm sitting there. 
So, because you're trying to get chemistry. Right. And we had some of, you know, we had so many people. It's like we had reality show stars. We had actresses. We had child stars. We had some, some everybody that was a woman of color, I would say just about came through there. Wow. And I mean, chemistry isn't something that you can just manufacture, right? I mean, like it's either there or, or, or it's not. Right. Right. It's either there or it's not. Um, you know, there's some people, they feel like they can talk. They feel, yes, this is a talk show. I can talk. And I found out they couldn't, you know, <laughs> it's like, whoo, girl, you. It's girl, not as easy uh, as it looks, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not as easy as it looks. And that's why you have the chemistry test. So out of the chemistry test, they came up with, you know, this, the set of girls that um, they thought would work best together. And that's right. how it actually came to be. Okay. So now in, in the first, uh, the first chapter of, of the book, I mean, off the rip, it shows how ambitious you were. Coming from the projects in, in Detroit and starting your own grocery, grocery service, you talked about how it was a different route for you to get to Hollywood. Uh, can you tell us about that and why you, and, and why you went that route? Well, you got to remember, I grew up during the crack era, Lebron. Sure. Yes, and during the crack era, I was in the projects. It was a very, uh, it was a very sad um, community because there wasn't a lot of money. There weren't a lot of jobs. And then boom, here comes crack. And crack for about two years, and I talk about it, um, is there. And it's providing opportunities for people. Right. Um, and then what happens is, is that then the adults start getting the children involved, the teenagers, the 13-year-olds, right. the 14-year-olds, because at the time, the laws were that, you know, if you were um, a teenager, you would just go to juvenile if you got caught with drugs. So they were recruiting heavily, and I didn't want to be a part of that. Right. You know, and so I needed to make some money. And then one day it came to me, um, it was cold, you know, the winters in Detroit can be like bad. And um, there was uh, senior citizens in my building that couldn't go to the store. And so one, you know, my mom made me take, you know, go for one of them. And I did it and gave him the groceries. And then he gave me a dollar. And I was like, what's this for? He said, for doing this for me. And I was like, and then it hit me. I can make money. And so I was Uber before, you know, I was Uber Eats before <laughs> Uber Eats even started. <laughs> right. You know what I'm and so then that's when I realized, wow, I can make money by doing this. And so then I started, you know, making money and it felt good. You know, even though I wasn't making the money like the, the, the dope boys was making, right. but I had my own thing. And so that's how that came to be. And it was just, it, it also gave me delight in, first of all, I was making my own money. And sure. I was also helping people. And so that was important to me. Absolutely. Like uh, there, uh, there's a line that I love in a book where, where it goes, that spam is not worth um, a slip and fall. And, and, <laughs> uh, and I just cracked up because I was like, man, <laughs> she's out here hustling for real. <laughs> that was an advertiser. And I'm like, hey, don't, don't do that. You know, let, let the youngins get it for you. So yeah, but it was, it was a very creative time for me. But it also allowed me to make, a, you know, a little bit of money, which was good, sure. you know. Um, one of the parts of um, I, during during your chapter where you where you talked about the crack era and and you talked about how you would see fifteen year old guys roll around um, in very expensive cars, and I guess there was someone who saw you, um, you know, with your uh, with your shopping cart, and you thought he was trying to buy your business from uh, from you, <laughs> but uh, but he wasn't. And uh, and the little the little guy Willie that you had a crush on, he kind of saved you uh, in a sense. Um, can you talk about that a, a little bit? Yeah, my crush was Willie. Oh, I just loved Willie. <laughs> and you got to remember, like I said back then, you know they were recruiting as heavily with the boys. Right. And so the, the thing I also want people to realize in this book is that I tell my story, but I also have levity in it because. Okay. You, if if I didn't put levity in this book, it would just you'd be crying throughout the whole right the whole book. <laughs> so I didn't want that. So um, but I can remember, you know, I had my business going and I was, you know, doing my thing and I had regular customers. And um Willie, who was my crush, I didn't know that he had got involved in that whole situation with it with one of the um the dope boys. And 
um, one day they, I was, you know, pulling my wagon and he stopped in his Mercedes Benz and Willie was in the other uh, passenger seat. And he was like, yo, you know, whatever he said. And he was telling me, cause what he wanted me to do was deliver drugs. Cause he right. saw how successful that I was doing. And I'm so innocent, you know, I'm a big girl with glasses. Nobody's gonna <laughs> suspect me. So, you know, so he's basically trying to recruit me. But in my mind, I'm thinking he's trying to cut in on my business. And I'm like, my goodness, you know, don't try to cut in on my business. Right, and he's yeah. like, what are you talking I'm about? I'm getting this money over, uh, you know, <laughs> right. I'm over here. <laughs> right. So I'm like 13, 14 years old. Don't, don't try to get on this, okay? <laughs> but, you know, Willie, knowing who, how I am and who I was and in and, and, and his attempt to protect me, you know, kind of diffused all of that and said, you know, she a nerd. She right. don't know what's, you know, she's crazy. And that's just the love that... Right. Um, that we had within the in the community, you know, of trying to protect each other, even though we were under dire circumstances. Yeah, I know. Like that was uh, that was real cool because, like, at the time, you know, you maybe had thought that, you know, is he dissing me? But it was like a blessing in disguise, though. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it was definitely my feelings was hurt. I was like, is he hurting my feelings? And then when I look back, he was just trying to get the guy to drive on away, right. you know, and leave me alone. Yes, you know, so he was like, oh, she's a nerd. Look at her. Look at her fat knees. <laughs> you know, I was fat like, knees. Willie, <laughs> for real? I think my knees are sexy. What's happening? <laughs> you no, know, um, so no, uh, one thing like that I have to ask you. Oh, and, and by the way, you guys, in the in the book, like after each chapter, she has these little um, um I guess you call them rules um or lists. And one of the things that that you put, and I'm still trying to scratch, I'm scratching my head about this, is, is like, was it like uh slice two slices uh, uh, of government cheese some ketchup and some fritos to make uh to, to make some to make some spaghetti i'm like that's got to be some detroit stuff cuz i'm i'm like <laughs> we don't <laughs> i've never heard of that before oh yeah oh yeah we were very inventive in detroit um the list um after every chapter is there a list of things that pertains to that chapter right and right. like i said originally in the book there are some stories that are happy there are some stories that are sad I wanted the reader to leave with some point of levity. So that's the reason for the list. And so what you're talking about was like the, the Bruce, Brewster Douglas survival guide. Right. And one of them was how you make something out of nothing. So you put everything together and then you can make you some uh, Detroit style macaroni and cheese with no <laughs> macaroni and no cheese. Yeah. I was like, wow. All right. <laughs> hey though, but you know, like um, it's uh, you know, that's one thing that I noticed throughout throughout the book is like it was almost like you're making something out of nothing and and you know you just you know you just kept going I mean it's for me so I've always been in love with the tales of people coming from the bottom and making it and throughout the book we see you go to high school you know we see you um, get the job General Motors. Then, then you go to college like being born in the projects like was that something like did you just have that drive that where you just wanted more or, or or I'm like, where did that come from? I have no idea, Leron, where it came from. <laughs> I think I was forced into situations. I think that's sure. what people are going to read about. Um, you know, at, at a certain point around 16 or 17, you know, I was kicked out of the house by my mom. So I basically right. had to force myself to get myself together and um, ended up getting the job at General Motors. And from there, you know, the story goes where I, I met a mentor and my life actually changed. Right. Um, and I think at that point is when I started to realize that even in your darkest moments, sometimes you have to let the process play itself out. And when you let the process play itself out, something comes to help you get out of that dark spot if you're open to it. So here I was, you know, 17 years old, sleeping in my car. I was working at General Motors. I had graduated and I didn't know anything about college. I didn't know, you know, whatever, you know, and um, I didn't know where my life was going to lead. I just thought maybe I would be building these truck doors. I was building sure. 500 truck doors a day. I was pasting carpet on the truck doors and there was glue all over the place. And <laughs> I messed those truck doors up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there was someone that came to me with as a father figure that actually led me out of it. 
And so it's a wonderful story of, of mentorship and it shows the importance of us, you know, taking care of one another. And I sure. try to pay it forward to this day. Absolutely. I, uh, I read that, uh, that you are a mentor to young women um, in the STEM, uh, in the sort of the STEM job market. Uh, how, did you, uh, how did you come to start doing that? You know, um, Michelle Obama really got me into it. <laughs> oh, okay, when right she on. realized that I was an uh, engineer, she's Michelle? like, wait, you what? You're an engineer? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know, I know. It, it seems impossible, but I have an engineering degree. And so when she was, um, uh, as first lady, she developed this wonderful STEM uh, program. And sure. so I started getting involved with that and, you know, being outspoken and letting young girls know the importance of, you know, science and technology and engineering because, you know, and there's a story of how I got into engineering because, you know, people, you don't normally see a lot of women. And so not I think all. it's important, even if you're not in the field anymore, to still, you know, support the field and support young girls. Um, and so that's what I do. So I have to thank Michelle Obama for getting me into that. Right. No, like, um, I, um, I like that story because when I was, probably my favorite story was uh, in the book is when you met Mr. Arnold and, uh, and you guys sort of clicked over the autobiography of Malcolm X, which is, which is one of my all-time favorites favorite books and and you know he encouraged you and so now that you're doing doing that you know it, it, it's just every, everything kind of comes together um, as a circle you know yeah it's a lovely story of how I met Mr. Arnold who uh, the readers will find out is my mentor and it uh you know when I was reading the autobiography of Malcolm X I was trying to find myself and I didn't know sure. so I was just looking for you know different materials to read it's just you know and he happened to you know see it on the line because you know most of the time I wasn't working anywhere I was reading <laughs> and, so, and when he saw it that struck up a friendship and I think that that was a sign that he knew that I was searching for something and he really helped me to at least get some focus in my life and that's why it's, it's always important to look at signs I look you know, for Absolutely. signs, especially with young people, um, you know, because if they need help, sometimes you, it's just a simple sign like a book and you and then you can strike up a conversation and you never know what that may lead to. Right. Yeah. No, like um, you definitely have to uh, have to follow the signs. That's something that I that I really uh, identify with myself. Rewinding a little of uh, a little bit. Um, one thing that I read in the book is that you started or you began to sort of like develop your comedy skills in, in the third grade. Uh, I believe it was imitating uh, Mrs. Kilpatrick. <laughs> uh, can, you, uh, can you talk about um, how, you, how you sort of fell into comedy and, uh, and how you realized that you like to make people laugh? When I was in school, I was a big girl and, you know, I was so big, people thought I was a substitute a lot of times, right? Come on. So, <laughs> you can't be so, doing that. <laughs> no, it's like, is that the substitute? Who is that big girl? It's like, it's, I'm a kid. You know, I was some big old tall girls, didn't have my motor skills right, you know, and all this. It's like, but I was always the big girl. And right. so Mrs. Kilpatrick was the teacher. And when she would leave, she, you know, would put the biggest person in charge because those kids was bad. And right. even though I was this big girl and I was this statuist and I, you know, thought I was, you know, I was really scared of those kids because they were bad. And so one time um, she had us in the classroom and she told me to watch the class and and they were just all over the place. And I'm thinking in my mind, in my mind how am I going to get their attention? How am I going to get them to respect me? How am I going to get them to listen and be quiet and don't tear up this classroom so I don't get in trouble? And then I just started imitating Mrs. Kilpatrick. And that was my first taste of comedy. And it was the most exhilarating feeling of because first of all my crush Willie was there and he was like girl you crazy really? <laughs> I was like dang I got Willie's attention and then you know and everybody just started laughing it was just and, and you know she and I was just you know like class class and he, they just it's just this feeling I was like wow you can keep people's attention and it felt so powerful 
And I think that was my first taste of comedy, definitely. Got it, got it, got it. So now, uh, ask you this: like, what is it? What is it about comedy for you that uh, that you know that that sort of moves you that that gets uh, Lonnie Love? Well, you know, I didn't have a body for a stripper, oh. and um, I couldn't okay. sing, and I couldn't hold. I can't hold a note. Right. Um, <laughs> but it goes all the way back to the Miss Kilpatrick days of right. seeing the look on people's faces, the children laughing. And these were children that were, you know, they were poor. Um, right. They were, you know, a lot of their parents were on drugs. And so what we call bad was really them acting out. Sure. And so to see that I was able to give them some levity, even for that short amount of time, it just carried over into my life. And so now when I started doing comedy, I started seeing that you could have people's attention and you could let them escape for a minute. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever been on a stage, but when I'm on a comedy stage and especially a small club, it's maybe about 300 or 400 people. Right. I can see them. I always like some comics like it dark. I don't like it dark. I like to keep the lights just a little bit so I can see their faces because I want to see them laughing and I wanna see their expressions. And it's the most beautiful thing to me. And that's what keeps me in the comedy. That's what actually got me to taking it seriously right. and pursuing it. Because it's, I've said, you know, I felt like it was a, a reason for me doing this. If I can, you know, help people forget about their problems for a minute and make them laugh, um, I think it'll be worth it. And so that's what really made me get into comedy. Awesome, awesome, awesome. <clears throat> when you uh, when you came to LA, uh, you talk about how you were just you would uh, you would work, you know, and your days off, or even at night, you would uh, you would hit the open mics, and you would every couple months you would just call in sick. <laughs> I mean, like you like you know <laughs> you came to LA with a plan. I mean, I'm just I was like, damn, like she really like on it, like she wanted. Um, Talk about how the just the the journey as far as like coming to L L L A hitting like that comedy circuit. Like uh, you talked about going from the Chitlin circuit to the uh, to the Laugh Factory. Once I decided to actually pr pursue comedy, because before that I you know got my degree and I graduated, but pursuing comedy, I was unhappy being a traditional person. I had had a good job. I was an engineer. And, you know, I had dental benefits. Oh, you know, as a black woman, you got dental benefits, you done came up. Got to get you them know. teeth straight. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, the thing was, okay, you got a good job. You got this boyfriend. Now you got to get married. And for right. some reason, as a 22-year-old um, female working as in, in a, a culture, it was a culture shock, first of all. And... I, you know, there's supposed to be these points in your life when you're like, okay, now it's time for you to take the next step, which is to get married. And I just didn't feel that. And there's a bunch of stories in there about why and what I was going through with my, my ex-boyfriend and his mama trying to make me a, a black Stedford wife and all this kind of stuff. But one day I was just so depressed. I was so like despondent that I was just driving around Los Angeles and I ended up at the comedy store and I was watching a comedy uh, show and there were all these guys doing comedy, but there was only one female. And I was like, wow, why is it only just one? And then that's when I started really researching because I really kind of started doing stand up in college and I talk about that um, for um, money, but I never pursued it out, you know, cause the whole thing is when you're black in this country you need to get that degree because you never know what's gonna happen. So I'm like, let me get that degree because I need a job. I need to take care of myself and everything. And I'm, you know, so that was the whole plan. But I was, you know, got the job, had the dental benefits and was still just sad, lonely, depressed. And then that's when I realized, let me start going back into comedy and performing. And so that's what I started doing. From that day, I, you know, and you got to realize with comedy, you have to go bare bones. Nobody knows your name, so you got to try to get your name out there. 
So you had to go to open mics. So I still needed to work and I was working my engineering job full time. And then at night I would go out to all the clubs. And when you're not known, they make you wait. So back then they would make you wait till like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, just to get on stage, just to get five minutes. And that's what I did. I did that for like three years because what I was doing was building up my, my name. I was building up an act. And um, I would go to work in the, in the day, but then I would stay out. So I basically was burning a candle at both ends, but that's what I had to do, you know, to build myself up. And I talk about that a lot, you know, right. and that's why I really wanted this book because I wanted to show people, because a lot of people know me from the real, or they may know me from Chelsea lately. They know me from, you know, some movies I've been in. They don't realize the whole journey that it took. Right. to get here and why I get so emotional when I think about it. Right. No, um, one of my, uh, another of, of, of my favorite lines uh, is that you said, uh, getting booed ain't, uh, ain't the worst thing in life. You can come back from that. And mm-hmm. so someone who doesn't do do comedy, I'm thinking like, yeah, like if they boo you, it's like, oh man, like, you know what I mean? How did you sort of built up that, um, uh, I guess, um, that sort of armor? Well, it's all trial and error. That's why you have to do, you have to do like for a good, I would say a good six, seven years, I was doing a lot of road work. And in that quote, when I say getting booed isn't the worst thing, the worst thing is the silence. So if somebody's booing you, you can you can heckle back <laughs> and get the crowd back on your side. But when you tell the joke and don't nobody do, everybody like this, that's like <laughs> that's death because you can't it's like you just sitting it you just standing there that's worse so i would rather for you to boo me because i can come back on that you know I me mean? but when you just silent i remember what i was first starting and it was up in michigan somewhere and i really needed that money it was a it was a college it was a college i can't remember the college but it was a college and when I tell you, them kids did not understand nothing I was saying. They was like, and a it was stone face. It was a stone face, and it's nothing you could do. That, that is the worst thing, and that's where that comes from. So, in order to avoid all of that, you have to do the road. I want to say this too. They try to say that women are not funny. That's not it. You don't see a lot of women doing stand up. So, because you don't see as many doing stand up. You think they're not funny. No, because it's really hard. You know, I was a road comic. I still do the road, but I was a road comic, like just straight for, like I said, about six, seven years. And the issue with women is that, you know, you got to remember, I'm like 25. Those are baby making years. Those are years when you're supposed to be developing your your, um, relationships. So you go on the road every weekend. It's hard to have a relationship. If you have a baby as a woman, you know, you got to stay off the road for nine months. So it's not that women are not funny. You just don't see a lot of women, you know, doing stand-up comedy because it's just a different type of beast, you know? Right, right, right. Um, do you remember, uh, uh, do you remember a, a show? I mean, like, well, let me ask this. Like, was there ever a show that you had that was, was terrible? You know, you kind of bombed and you thought, okay, maybe this isn't what I need to be doing. Never. I never had a show that I, I never, and I never, like, you got to understand, once you start doing comedy, you start developing comedy friends, and you become part of the comedy community, and that is the sweetest, strongest, strangest community ever, because we're a bunch of people that are trying to make people laugh, and so, you know, the the thing is, we become each other's uh, support. So they're going to be nice when you like you bomb so bad, you know, especially it depends on rooms. Cause when you, when we, I was on the Chitlin circuit, there were always different types of rooms because you're trying to get the people in. So there's one room um, I'll never forget where the, um, the host would tell people, if you don't like the comment, j- just jingle your keys. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> It's like the keys, you know. What I mean? And so the thing was, you just like you just hoping people don't, you know, jingle those, don't jingle your keys, please don't jingle keys. That's like the so, Apollo, you know what I mean? Yes. Like you're like Sandman, yes. like yes. So it's like 
you gotta understand when you're going through that, it's like anxiety. It's like, and and what you learn to do because you you got your county community. Like if they was jingling keys on you, you was just like, you know what? What's up, keys? You know, <laughs> you joke about it. That's when you joke about it, and you take it on the chin. And what you do is you get back up there the next night. And that's the thing that I had to learn is that different audiences are different. One night they're laughing at the joke. Then the next night they looking at you like this. I mean, you know, it, the, the famous Steve Martin said what made him stop doing stand up was Friday second show. <laughs> that Friday second show in America, you know, people are people are tired from work. They usually right. drunk. They sleepy. <laughs> so that is usually the hardest show in the country. And if you can make the Friday second show laugh, audience laugh, you really are a good comic. Okay. Uh, is there any particular uh, venues or cities that you know you love performing more uh, more than others? Uh, any any venue where they actually pay you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. At the end of the night, you know, because when you on that chitless circuit, to be some nice days, the promoter come to you. Uh, let me holler at you for a minute. <laughs> Whenever like, they yeah, say that. Whenever they say, "Let me holler at you for a moment." <laughs> You know you're not about to get paid. <laughs> oh my god! Like, I'd be so time, disappointed. It's it's in the book too. It's all these like road stories of uh, that we you know because what we would do is different people would try to you know make a show and we try to find a promoter. And one time we mistakenly didn't know. We went to Arizona, and the guy we trusted you know the guy that um, made the show, but we didn't know he was working for this guy. The guy named was Face. I should have known when he said face that there was a problem. (laughs) This dude ended up being like a pimp and he wanted to not only be in the pimp services, but he, now he wanted to try to, you know, become a a comedy promoter. Like an actual pimp. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Actual pimp. Like we, we all flew to, it was about five of us. We flew to Arizona and um, the way I knew he was a pimp was because you know we had a hotel room not at the door here comes this lady and i was like she was like really rough like and she was like right. face said get downstairs i said wait but who is face he's like face that's daddy i'm like wait what <laughs> and so i'm looking at my other and i'm the only female and right. so we get down there because the the actual show was at the at the hotel and we get down there and Nobody is at the show because he didn't know how to promote it, but he thought he was going to, cause everybody thinks putting on a comedy show is easy. Right. So ultimately, no flyers I, out. No, no, they did no flyers. I think he had one flyer. I was like, can't you get your girls to pass out flyers? What happened? <laughs> Fake. And what was funny about that whole situation was we were all together and I learned so much from that situation. I, and I talk about it in the book because we were in Arizona. So when we went to the airport, we didn't get paid because there wasn't nobody in there. We went to the airport. Wow. We had one-way tickets. So we didn't have tickets back home. Okay. So luckily, because I was still working my day job, I had to use my credit card and I got everybody back home. Wow. That is... <laughs> But I mean, you know, you you know, you've obviously paid your dues, though. I mean, that's you know, just stories on on, on the road to uh, to getting to where you are. Um, Lonnie, one of the most important um, points in the book is, uh, you know, app, you know, you're you're in Los Angeles, and after months of dieting and exercise, you realize that the women you looked up to, like Oprah and Moms Mainly, I'm sorry, Moms Mabley, uh, my uh, my fault, didn't gain success by conforming. They broke down barriers, and they became successful um, on, on their own terms. Can you talk about that one moment in, uh, in your life when, uh, when, when you realize this? Um, I was, you know, this was in part of the book where I was auditioning and, you know, and at the time in the early 2000s, Hollywood was really different where, uh, you know, a woman like me who's tall, who's dark skinned, who's curvy, there were only one or two um parts for us like with one line you know where's your coffee you know here's your coffee sir 
and then you go on the audition. Can you say a little bit sassy? You you uh, uh you wrong for that one. But it's like <laughs> no, but it's 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 true. I mean, literally, literally one line, and that's what. I, and so you got to remember, I'm trying to audition for parts, but then as an engineer, I'm going, what is what's the issue? I need to solve this. Sure. So I thought solving would be changing. I thought, you know, okay, I'm going to lose a whole bunch of weight. I'm going to give me a blind wig. And um, then I'm going to take me some um, French classes. And <laughs> it, when I tell you it was a mess, it, it, was, it was a pure mess. But what I was trying to do was conform to what I thought Hollywood wanted. Sure. And it wasn't going to work for me because that was not me. And luckily, I did have, at the time of coming up, I had the Monique's, I had, you know, uh, Oprah's um, to look up to. But I didn't I didn't know their fight until later. Right. So you got to remember, because I didn't know them, I can just only see whatever's being put out there. So I'm trying to get into this system. And, you know, these people are looking at me like, we can only use you for this. And so at that moment, that's when I realized either I'm just going to accept the fact of who I am and accept my flaws. And that's why I tell people, you know, flaws, you can fix them or sometimes flaws are meant for you to stand out. And so with me being the person that I was, the plus size, dark skinned girl, later on in life, I just started accepting it. And I was able to use it to make me the person that I am today. So I tell anybody, if you think you got a flaw, if you got a flaw, you want to fix it, fine. If not, be proud of your flaw. If you got a big nose, take side profile pictures. Just, you know, you know, this is my nose. This is who I am. <laughs> Accept it. Embrace it. Because it's going to make you stand out. You know, look at Barbara Streisand. You know, look at her nose. You know what I mean? We know that's her. But right. if she would have tra- changed it for somebody else, you know, who knows what it would have done. Maybe it would have hurt her voice. Maybe it, w- it wouldn't have been her. Right. So I think, you know, I had to learn that. And that's what I learned in the book is to learn to accept flaws and let those flaws make you stand out. Okay. Now, um, there. so we're in a time right now where, you know, racism is at the forefront of, 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 of everyone's mind. You know, it's a it's one of the two uh, main conversations. I, I would say racism as well as as well as COVID nineteen. In yeah. the book, you you talk about an incident where you were with a friend, and there was and, and there was an encounter with the police, and that could have went left fast, and maybe we would not be doing this interview. <clears throat> when I read that part, Lonnie, I I just thought to myself, I was like, I was like, darn, like when black people will come in contact with, with the police, it could just go bad. And I, and I thought about George Floyd. Can you talk about that incident and how you feel about uh, the, uh, the current, uh, the current co- conversation of, of race we're having right now? You know what? The thing is, is that when I initially wrote this book, George Floyd was living. Right. Ahmaud Arbery was living. Um, Breonna Taylor was living. And it's funny because now if I hadn't have talked about this incident, I wouldn't be able to show people that everyday black people that are just innocent, that's just, you know, working or going to school, they can get caught up in a situation. And so I think that story right now it's the whole purpose of this book. And wow. at the time, I didn't know that that would be the purpose of it. I was just telling my story. And that's why it's important for people to tell stories. Basically, I was 19 years old. I was working in a grocery store in Houston because I was um, going to school in, at Prairie View, Texas. Um, one night, me and my friend who worked along with me decided we were going to go to the club after we got off work. Went to the club. I got my cheetah pants on. Woo, I'm looking good. Then we say, oh, girl, you know, after the club, you've been drinking, go get something to eat. So we go to eat, and it's a cafeteria-style place where you get your food, and you get a tray, and you just get your food, and then you get your drink. Well, she's ahead of me, and I'm riding with her. And I look, and I hear this commotion, and I see this big white cop grabbing her, and it was a security guard grabbing her. And I was like, whoa, that's my ride. Where was he taking her? And he takes her in the kitchen. 
So I'm like freaking out, like what is going on? So I, you know, step into the kitchen. He looks at me. He says, you're arrested. I said, arrested for what? He said, you're trespassing. I said, what is that? What are you talking about? You stepped in the kitchen. Now, understand this. I grew up in the Brewster Projects, but we ain't never called the police. That's one thing. In the projects, the number one rule, don't call the police unless somebody dead. Other than that, we're going to handle it. So I don't know about the police. Okay? I never had a, my mother never gave me a talk about the police. So I'm going down here in college, and this is my first time dealing with this situation of being arrested. My friend, I said, well, what did she do? He said, she put soda in a water cup. Right. I'm like, <laughs> soda in a water cup. Now, we 19-year-old Black women. And he handcuffed us. He called the, the, the Houston police. The police car came down and put us in the back. And in hindsight, I look at it and I go, I'm glad that I was with her because if I wasn't, I don't know right. what those cops could have done to her. Because when I looked at that one cop who was, both of them were white, but when I looked at one and you know me, I'm just, you know, I'm talking. I'm like, I, we didn't do, cause I, you, you, when you get arrested and you don't know what's going on, you literally were confused. I was literally confused. I was scared. I was confused. I'm like, sorry, we didn't do anything. She put soda in the water cup. He just looked, he said, they all say that. And right. it was so dismissive. It was so <laughs> insulting. And it was just like, you gotta understand what I, and I say in the book, in Detroit, I grew up in this cocoon of blackness. This was my first taste of breaking out of that cocoon. Of that cocoon. We were took to the booking station and um, it was amazing what I saw, LeBron. I mean, this booking station was nothing but people of color and they were mainly males. And I can remember the picture in my mind of seeing the brothers walking around. They had those shackles. Right. And it's a, it, and I talk about it, but it's a feeling I never forget. And so, because she had um, put soda in a water cup, that was a petty theft. Right. So it was a misdemeanor, but trespassing is a felony. Wow, I and did not know that. No, I, I, I did not either. And so I didn't even know what a felony was. I'm 19. So they put me in, you know, the area with other felons. And I talk about it in the book and I and I bring levity to it. But they put me in, in you know, the, the thing that I want the reader to understand is that if we were two 19-year-old white girls, more than likely, we would not have been arrested for a $1 cup of soda. We would have even been told to pay for the soda or we would have just had a slap on the wrist. But that man saw that we were black and he did that to us. And what I want people to understand is that I was in college. I had to get bailed out. I was a college student with no money. So I had to, you know, find the money to bail myself out. My friend didn't have anybody to call. She had to call her parents. Her parents had to come down from Dallas. Wow, that's a drive. And get her out. So she had to spend like two days in jail. I spent about 18 hours. And in that 18 hours, you don't know what could have happened. Luckily, I got out of it, but it was really a situation that did not need to happen. And I know you could say, well, she shouldn't have put the soda in the water cup, but she was a kid and it was a $1 soda. So why would you put somebody in jail for a $1 soda? You wouldn't have done that if those were two white girls. And that is what Americans are going through. Black Americans are saying, we just want to be treated equally. That's all. That's all. You don't put people in jail for a soda. You don't do that. But at the time when I wrote it, Laurent, I didn't think right. that it would, it would be so, it would be an example of what Black people go through every day with discrimination and racism. This is just one of the many examples. And that's why it's important for people to read the stories Absolutely. of people of color so that they can understand we're not whining. We're telling you, you know what could have happened in that jail? 
it was all kind of stuff. And then you read about it. You read about what you know could have happened to me if I hadn't gotten out. They actually put me on a on a bus to transfer me. And then I started freaking out because I was like, what if can't, what if nobody can find me? You know, and and then I was put into this room in the other facility. And I was like, what if a fire breaks out? I started having all kinds of anxieties and things, things that should not have happened over one dollar soda that I didn't even I didn't even take. That is the issue that we're dealing with in this country when we talk about discrimination, when we talk about, you know, bias and racism. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, it, for, for me, like this, uh, the fact that you were just arrested for something trivial, and I was like, wow, like, you know, I mean, if the cop could have pushed it further and but I mean, I'm I'm really happy that you added that to the book, Lonnie, because I mean, it, you know, even though the uh, the book is about your journey, it's it's full of of levity and, and and laughter. It you know it it has that serious center, and and that's one of the stories that um, that just sort of makes it stick. Definitely. Um, one uh one quick question before we get to the uh, to audience Q and A, what are your thoughts on uh, as far as the COVID-19, the coronavirus, how this has affected you and and what we should do to kind of keep ourselves safe? Well, you see, we're talking to each other through this, <laughs> these contraptions. Yeah. Case, you know, I mean, you, you know, you, I've lost the ability to be with an audience, um, but I can't look at this selfishly. I'm more concerned with the fact that COVID is attacking especially people of color more than anything. And that we as a country, a lot of us don't give a damn. Right. And we need to stop that. And Absolutely. we need to have some federal mandated um, policies to help us to get over this because it's, it's spiking and it's out of control. And so what I'm trying to do is just lend my voice as a person who has a platform First of all, to help people and tell them, hey, you know, stay in the house, be socially distanced, wear your mask if you go out, you know. But also, you know, I try to communicate with the people. I do IG live, um, I do Facebook lives, just to, just to give people an hour, just to you know, get away. I think it, when you're an entertainer, you're always an entertainer, whether sure. you're going to be, you know, in, on a stage or you know, on Zoom. I think that it's important for us to be there for each other, but we really have to knock this out. Absolutely. And we really have to start talking about this, okay. seriously. Um, so now Lonnie, let's, uh, let's get to some uh, audience uh, Q, uh, questions. All right. Crystal, um, she says, um, I recently saw you on RuPaul's Drag Race. It was a great episode. Did you have <laughs> as much you. fun as it looked? Oh my goodness, RuPaul's Drag Race was so much fun. When they said women can't do drag, that is not true. <laughs> they had me all in drag. <laughs> and I have, they put on these hips and a corset. And, you know, I always look at, um, you know, the thing about what I always loved about RuPaul's Drag Race is that that was a show that's not supposed to succeed. That was a show that, you know, no, no, nobody wants to see that stuff. And look at it. It's an Emmy award winning show. It is just, I feel like it's a place where I can be accepted and people that want to, you know, do drag, it, it lets you become a different type of person. And so I just had a ball and um, I knew I was going to lose to Vanessa Williams. She a pageant queen. <laughs> I was like, why, how y'all going to do that to me? You know, yeah. so, but it she's, was, it was she's really got fun. experience though. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I knew I was going to lose, <laughs> but I wanted to, but I raised money for Dress for Success and I just, I just had a great time and I, and I want to go back to judge hopefully one day. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nick asks, what's your favorite part of working with each of your co-hosts on The Real? You know, everybody is different. What I like um, about working with the girls is that they're, you know, they know how to come together. And I want to say this about the real, we are women that choose to work together, you sure. know, and that's important, especially because people think that women can't get along, keep people, women can't work. That is not true. Um, Tamara and I are probably the closest because she just forces me to be with her. 
<laughs> but I, you know, but she's so spiritual and loving. And that's what I like about her. And I lean on her when I need that. When I need some more spiritual guidance, I can lean on that. When I need fashion advice, I lean on Jeannie because she's so right. stylish and she knows about fashion. She knows about the cuts, you know, and all the latest stuff. So I always lean on her for that. And then Munchkin is the party girl. Like, you know, even though she's just gotten married, she still knows how to throw a good party. She's into family. Um, so, you know, as a matter of fact, she just made me go to a Bible study a few really? days ago. Okay. Yeah, a Zoom Bible study. She she texted me. She said, come, come to the Bible study. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to come to the Bible study. Well, I didn't know I was going to be part of a panel. And so I'm like, uh, they're like, Lottie, can you say? I'm like, I am the biggest heathen out here. What <laughs> You don't want me talking about me. (laughs) (laughs) So, but yeah, but definitely each girl brings something different and I lean on them for different things. Okay. Uh, James asked, how has comedy served you in these traumatic times? I'm telling you, it's sometimes you got to laugh to keep from crying. That's what the, 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 the way the phrase goes. Um, Comedy has really helped me because, you know, some with the news, being so heavy at times, I have to uh, just automatically, I tend to try to think differently. And that's just my sense of humor. And then, so that helps me, that gives me balance to get through. And so what I try to do is I try to, you know, on my platforms balance and use that to help other people. Cause I know these are heavy times for us. So you know, when it's time to be serious, I'm serious. But then I know sometimes it's, you know, it's time to take a break. And that's what I try to do. And I try to get that levity and pass it on to people so that we can get through this. Okay. And one more question. Leon asks, what was the hardest part about putting your book together? You know, the hardest part was deciding what stories to put in and what stories to take out. Because I've been journaling since I was 10 years old. And I want anybody out there listening to journal. And when I say journal, it ain't no excuse why you can't do it now. I mean, even if you don't write, you could just take your little voice notes. And in the morning, maybe when you wake up, say something. Or at night, how do you feel? Or get you a little notebook and write down, just even if it's just a couple of lines about maybe what are you going to do today or how you're feeling. Because these are historic times. We need to record our stories. I've been doing this since I was 10 years old. And so I've had stories and I still have more stories. So it's probably going to be a second part to this book um, about my upbringing. And this is just, you know, my story. and And it just shows you that you can come from humble beginnings and you can be an Emmy winning actress. That's what life is about. It's just funny. Fantastic. It is an informed tradition to ask all of our speakers the following question. What is, okay. your, what is your 60 second idea to change the world, Lonnie? Let's hear it. Oh, my God. Just 60 seconds to change the world? Just 60 seconds. One minute. Okay. Um, my idea to change the world is I think that we all should be required to do some form of stand up, every person mm. on this earth. Because when you do that, it's going to make you reflect on something and find some positivity and some levity in everything. So I think I would have everybody have to do a mandatory uh, comedy set. It was just for five minutes. We give you like a week to come up with the material and then you have to do it. And I think people would think better and, and make this world a better place. Um, will we hear the keys though? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I would be jiggling the keys on everybody. It's just, you are, you suck. No, no, be very encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, fan- fantastic. Well, thank you to Lonnie Love for joining us today at Inform at the Commonwealth Club. Please be sure to pick up a copy of I Tried So You Don't Have To at your local bookstore. It's, it's a really good book. If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual program, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm LaRon Barton. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thanks, LaRon. Ari Lonnie, be easy. <laughs>